Greetings, and welcome back to the Rose Bros Podcast. This episode, we are once again joined by Eric Nuttall, Partner and Senior Portfolio Manager with Nine Point Partners and the Nine Point Energy Fund. The Nine Point Energy Fund is Canada's largest energy fund with approximately $1.9 billion under management, primarily invested in Canadian mid-cap energy companies. Eric's views on energy are frequently sought after by BNM Bloomberg, CNBC, The Globe and Mail, The National Post, and other media organizations. Eric graduated with high honors from Carleton University with an honors bachelor of international business. Among other things, we discussed $100 oil, dividends for share buybacks, the importance of trust when investing, and why efficient market theory is wrong. Enjoy! This podcast episode is sponsored by Conate Water Solutions. Do you need cost-effective water sourcing options to supply your next drilling or completions program? Conate Water Solutions is a specialized hydrogeology company focused on water well drilling, testing, and water management services in Western Canada and Texas. Contact info at conatewater.com or check out conatewater.com for more details. This podcast is sponsored by headracingcanada.com. Looking for high-performance ski gear this winter? In partnership with four-time Olympian Manny Osborne Parody, HeadRacingCanada.com is offering the lowest prices possible through its online storefront by passing brick-and-mortar savings on to customers. Check out HeadRacingCanada.com for more info and get your high-performance ski gear for the upcoming season. Well, why don't we start? You bet. Eric Nuttall, good morning. Good morning. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for doing this. You bet. Happy to be with you. We're sitting here live on your office on Bay Street. This is a cool experience for me. First time in Toronto. Welcome to Toronto. <laughs> Why don't we get right into it? $100 oil. Are we headed there? I think so. No, I was taught long ago, if when you make a forecast, either do price, time, never the same in this in uh, you know the same sentence. So yeah, I think we're going structurally higher. Uh, you know, I've talked about how we think we're structurally undersupplied. You get these times in the energy market where you get divergences between what you think, you know, fair value is and what the rest of the market believes. And a unique challenge with oil is you've got two markets. Like you've got the physical market, which we try to assess using oil inventories and, you know, other sources of data. And then you've got the financial market. And so what we saw two weeks ago was with, you know, Credit Suisse and Silicon Valley Bank, a inversion of a trade that where banks were long oil and short treasuries. So they had to unwind that. You had companies that had sold puts to producers for their hedge book. Once the oil price approached what they had sold those at, they were suddenly exposed to a lot more risks. So they were sellers. And then you had guys jumping on the bandwagon and shorting. So we saw the sharpest liquidation in the history of the crude contracts two weeks ago. You know, happened to be when I was had my family down south. And you, the oil market usually tries to torpedo any vacations that I try to uh, try to take. So, you know, what do we see? We saw oil plunge ten bucks, fifteen percent in a week. So, as a guy who watch, tries to his best to evaluate fundamentals, I pose a question to myself: like, did the fundamentals change by such magnitude? You know, in a one week time period, and I think the obvious answer is is no. So. We continue to think that the market is undersupplied, like we're emerging from you know the weakest period of demand. It's progressively going to get stronger as it does every single year. Uh, stats coming out of China remain very bullish. You know, if you look at road traffic congestion, airline traffic, domestic, international, you get stats such as you know the demand for passports uh, from in the U.S. is up thirty to forty percent year over year. So you know, you know, admittedly, some passports would have expired over COVID, but you know that's a good sense of the demand for international travel, which is way more fuel intensive than domestic. So I think demand is going to be stronger than people think. I think supply uh, is going to underwhelm again. You know, we we look at U.S. shale growth of maybe five hundred thousand barrels per day this year, give or take. Uh, the the necessity to return free cash to the back to investors is not changing. You know, labor availability, inflation. There's just there's just so many crimps on uh, U.S. shale growth. I look at OPEC, where you know it was a ballsy forecast a year and a bit ago, saying, "Oh, you know, OPEC's per capacity exhaustion and such." But what do you see now? Is Saudi Aramco warning the world, saying, "You know, the industry is not investing enough." We cannot shoulder the burden. We're doing our best. It takes time. You know, it's a long cycle. It's four to six years, seven years for Saudi Aramco. So you see UE and Saudi adding 2 million barrels per day coming online 2025, 2027. 
And then you look at the super majors where, you know, there's just so much policy uncertainty caused by politicians with, you know, decarbonization and now profit windfall taxes, which is just the stupidest thing you should be doing in an energy crisis. Like you're crimping supply and you're rebating demand, you know, it should be the inverse, but, you know, populism and whatnot. So we see the super majors unable to invest with flat production out to 2030. So yeah, you can get these deviations where, you know, people panic about a banking crisis or my God, we're heading into a recession and therefore how it can't be bullish on oil and CTA sell and whatnot. Ultimately, fundamentals matter. And if inventories continue to fall, you know, we, we use a variety of firms. One is energy aspects. They model a recession in US, a recession in Europe, and yet Demand growth, non-OECD in China overwhelm any demand destruction, resulting in multi-year low oil inventories by the end of this year. So we just we try to stick to fundamentals. It's it's annoying at times when you get these these freakouts, but ultimately fundamentals matter and that that ultimately will dictate where price goes. On the flip side, what worries you? What keeps you up at night? Is it to think of it critically from the other side? Uh, American ingenuity, do you kind of keep your tabs no. on anything? What worries me is on the demand side, if there is a economic contraction similar to like a great financial crisis where, you know, China normalization, but, you know, you get non-OECD demand destruction combined with US and Europe and whatnot. Supply, I feel pretty good about, you know, there was a a really important conference about three weeks ago called Sarah Week in Houston. And you had all the shale luminaries essentially confirming what many of us thought, and that is it's a mature basin or basins, you know, the Permian especially. Uh, you, you, the, the days of million barrel per day growth are over. Technology has served its purpose, but now you're seeing well productivity getting worse. You know, gas to oil ratios going up, inventory life suddenly becoming a problem. So I don't, I don't see how U.S. shale can can disrupt the market meaningfully. OPEC, I feel pretty good about when the I get to have dinner with the Secretary General of OPEC and he confirms. In, in graphic detail about you know how how critically short we, we will we will be in the years ahead, and the super majors I feel good about because of cycle time. You know when the most sophisticated oil company on the planet, Saudi Aramco, says it would take seven years to add a million barrels per day, it gives me confidence that you know the less sophisticated companies who are blinded by you know wokeism and the need to pledge net zero by 2050 and you know is having my ilk over there demanding deleveraging buybacks and dividends and all of these things they're just starved of capital and there's just too much uncertainty to allow them to invest so it comes down to demand you know and that's not something i can i'm it's it's not my forte you know if there's a super strong economic contraction globally like i'm not talking about a soft landing i'm not talking about a plain vanilla recession i'm talking about something similar to covid or or the great financial crisis other than that i feel very good about where we're heading timing sure maybe it can take longer than i i think but as long as you're confident in where you're heading and you know you're not overexposing yourself so that you have a need to raise liquidity before you can see your call come to fruition. I, I feel quite good about things. Bay Street is a long way from Alberta oil fields. Do you view that as a positive in terms of your detachment from the industry, kind of like Warren Buffett in Omaha? It does it allow you to be objective in your evaluations? I think so. And performance would demonstrate that. You know, I have one competitor and he's a good competitor. And I'm sure, you know, in marketing, it'd be, well, we've got the Calgary advantage, right? We know what's going on. You know, my son plays hockey with his son and blah, blah, blah. And I I find like that, that, that can be act like a blinder. You know, you can be emotional. This patch has a lot of good guys, you know, men and women. Uh, people are humble. People are generally hungry. And you like to do business with friends. You like to invest with friends because you can trust. I do that. You know, my, I'm the biggest client of some uh, banks and energy traders, and they're personal friends because I know they're not going to screw me over. Uh, I invest only with people that I trust in. But if you're friends on a personal level, that can rob you of the objectivity where, you know, let's say well results are getting worse. Let's say something's eroding. The story is changing. It's very tough to see the guy in the hockey arena when it's publicly filed that you just blasted out his stock and then you get asked about it on BNN and you have to, got to you know, admit to such. So my performance would suggest it's not a hindrance. Uh, we get pretty good access to whomever we want to, to see. So yeah, I don't think it hinders me at all. Your job is to select undervalued companies and earn a rate of return on the investments Again, back to Warren Buffett, one of his influences was Phil Fisher and the kind of 
buying quality growth companies and just holding on to them forever. Do you ever think about that in terms of buying, say, like a super high quality micros tourmaline sort of company and just waiting for 10 years and make life easy for yourself? That's, you- that's the holy grail. Right. <laughs> right. So <laughs> find 10 companies, sit on them forever. Yeah. Um, what I find now is the market is incredibly inefficient because it's been a game of survivor and there's two of us left. Um, and so you've got ultra high net worth investors, you've got two institutions, and you've got some generals. And so the market is so inefficient that I find and volatile that you can find companies and as they get re-rated, you can then, you know, monetize a little, take the proceeds and then go buy other names that are as as or if not more underpriced or mis- mispriced. So, you know, there's very few companies some, but I, my, my style is more, you know, we've got a company that just did an acquisition and, uh, you know, the stock sold off and oh my God, there's, you know, drift style drift and they're not doing what you wanted them to do, which is complete nonsense. And so what's the advantage? You know, we got to, you know, model it up. My analyst who is in Calgary is a geologist. He meets with their technical team and, and what does he learn? Well, you know, the perception of the asset that they bought is poor because of poor well results. Well, is that geology or is that a, because the prior owner was a poor operator? Uh, our view is it was a poor operator. So w- we can buy into a name that we liked before. We like even more now. It's sold off, so it's cheaper. And there's a catalyst in that. We think we know the story better than others. And so that will allow us to, you know, allowed us to buy more shares at a discounted price. And as they tell the story, as well results, we hope corroborate what we think, then we've got that re-rating. So that's kind of more my my style as opposed to, you know, buying a stock and, you know, sitting on it for 15 years. <clears throat> Modern portfolio theory would suggest the markets are efficient. There's no point actually yeah, BS. trading Absolutely. stocks. Yeah. In your experience, you found that to be completely wrong. Absolutely. Yeah. For a variety of reasons, you know, how can I buy companies today where I think I'm getting decades worth of free cash flow for free? So reserves, right? I'll use an example. My biggest holding is a mid cap pure play oil sand company with 35 years of state flat inventory. And, you know, at $80 oil, they're trading at a 25% free cash flow yield. At 70, it'd be about uh, a 20, give or take. So let's say they can privatize four to five years. So I'm, I'm getting 30 years of reserves for free at $80 oil. They'll free cash flow a billion a year. So I'm getting $30 billion of value for, for nothing. And so how can I do that? Like, why do others not see what I see? So part of it is people suffer from profound energy ignorance. They just have, they buy into the nonsense that we're rapidly decarbonizing, we're, you know, there's alternatives, this is a sunset industry, the end of oil is looming, and therefore, you know, the, these these companies have no value, long dated reserves. I, I take the complete op- opposing view. And then because this has been such a tough sector to have been invested on in, you know, we've had several, obviously, very good years, but on an absolute and relative basis for the past decade, this has been, has been miserable. Every, anytime you feel bullish, anytime you feel optimistic, you get run over by something, whether it's the rise of U.S. shale or concerns about a hard landing in China many years ago to, you know, uh, COVID, like there's always something. So people, I feel, just don't want to get be hurt anymore. They don't want to believe. And so what that allows us to do is if we dare to dream a little and, you know, stick to our fundamentals, it allows us to see opportunities that I think just other people aren't, aren't seeing. I think I read the fund was at 1.25 million. Yeah. So we've gone from, we load, um, I think it was April, 2020. So during the, the depths of COVID of, you know, stocks and free fall and, and, and amazingly it wasn't from redemptions. I never really saw redemptions during COVID because I think people were just shell shocked. You couldn't believe, you know, stocks had fallen so much. So yeah, we loaded 26 million in my main fund and now we're at 1.9 uh, billion. So it's, it's been a pretty good journey. So the opportunity has been there in the sense of actively picking stocks from that perspective alone. <laughs> yes. And being optimistic, giving people factual reasons to believe that that was going, that, you know, the line I kept using, and frankly, was my own self-help, was this too shall pass. It was awful. It was horrific. We don't have to go through that again. But it was just very, very dark and it was awful. But my belief was that this too shall pass. Things are going to normalize. People, you know, as an investor, you should want panic. You should want fear because that cloudies people's ability to objectively and intelligently 
evaluate situations. So, you know, I would use Twitter and say, well, here's company XYZ. And, you know, they've, they've, they've got the balance sheet to get them through and they're trading at X, you know, X value. And if we think oil can just recover to $60, you know, we see 400% upside, et cetera. So, and a lot of it was just talking myself through and <laughs> reminding myself that this is going to pass. Um, How important do you think psychology is to investing? Oh, it's huge, massive. You have to have superior psychology. You know, I use the acronym FEAR, you know, false evidence that appears real. And I have the luxury of doing this, you know, as close to 24-7 as, as you can. So we're, we're deep in the weeds. But for a, a general investor where, you know, whether you, you hear some guy go on b and and oh, he's top deck, you buy it or you, you buy stocks on your own. If you don't have the compass, it allows you to drift. And so it's this, it's got to be the the psychology of being able to endure drawdowns and not allow price to set narrative. You know, stock falling, therefore, I must be wrong. I must have missed something, et cetera. That assumes the market is efficient. We touched on that is completely wrong, in my opinion. And so it's just having the 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 ability to weather losses temporarily, see through to it to, you know, evaluate, measure, see if you're wrong in your call, and having the staying power to to see through it. Otherwise, you know, there's, there's, I just find post COVID, like everybody is, there's, there's always a crisis. There's always a reason to be pessimistic. I have met very few rich pessimists. I've met many very wealthy optimists. So typically optimists do better and they've got a superior psychology and that, that allows them to not panic in moments of uncertainty. We talked about the first time we, on the podcast, one of your mentors, Eric Sprott, I think his advice you'd mentioned was to go be early and go in all in on in March 2020 when oil went to zero. Were you guys talking about investing on those days? Was was it time to buy? Did he kind of lead you in that direction? Or? Yeah, I just, so we I had, we separated from Sprott back in 2017. So I haven't uh, I don't have ongoing discussions with Eric, but he was he was a phenomenal mentor and i got to see him go through his dark days when you know the market was telling him that he was wrong for a period of time like he was very negative on tech stocks and such and the market went against him for for a period of time and he worried about redemptions and you know and he got through it and he had conviction and his calls proved to be correct so my lesson i have multiple many many lessons for him but he was a phenomenal mentor in my very early days like i literally started my career in 2003, working directly with him and then another gentleman, Jean-Francois Tardif, who was also a phenomenal mentor. And there was just have conviction, do the work, uh, you know, be be a, a student of whatever sector and just try to own it, you know. And, and then all it takes is one idea. Like the value of one, you don't have to have 50 great ideas. All it takes is one. And if you can get that call right, get it early and be exposed to benefit from it and just have the staying power to sit on your hands, not trip over pennies on your way to dollars and just just be patient. That's how you can make you know generational wealth. One of the criticisms is sometimes people fall into value traps or they think it's cheap price stock, but it's not. And it never really appreciates. Did mm-hmm. you think of that at times or how do you deal with that kind of aspect of it? So the difference between a value trap, as you correctly point out, a cheap stock and a mispriced stock that will get re-rated as a catalyst. And so what's exciting to me is that I've helped develop that catalyst, I think this year. And that is the the pivot of companies using free cash flow to delever to now rewarding shareholders for the misery of the past decade and by buying back their stock aggressively. Because I've, I've, I've believed that if companies en masse in this sector tell the average person, if you're too ignorant, if you don't, if you believe this is, you know, a sunset industry, et cetera, we do not need a single generalist person to ever have an interest in, in buying energy stocks again for energy stocks to re-rate to, I think, more than double. So long as boards do one thing and one thing alone, that is use free cash flow, maximize free cash flow, first of all, and then use it and aggressively buy back 15, 20, 25, 30% of their shares with the belief that what's the value of that last share? You know, We used an example in my top holding. Well, the la- it's a $21 stock price. And the value of that last share is worth about $30 billion, like not a terrible re-rating. So two things are going to happen. One is they privatize, and I'm the last guy holding that share on behalf of my clients. More likely, obviously, 
is the stock goes up as they aggressively buy back, you know, 30% of their stock in a single year and do it again and again and again. So it's not, when we talk about that, we're not after privatization of the sector. I'm not after running a, you know, a PE fund. It's, it's the creation of a catalyst that must drive that re-rating and share valuations. And that's what I think is going to be happening, you know, later this year is once the oil price cooperates a bit. On the subject of returning capital to shareholders, dividends have been pretty strong in certain companies. Yields approach 10%. Some people are worried that's unsustainable. Are Canadian dividends safe? Yeah, I don't know why they wouldn't be sustainable. We have a sector generating the most amount of free cash flow in its history. We have a sector with the strongest balance sheets in their history. Like we model at $80 oil uh, this year, $90 next. The sector will be debt-free Q2 of next year on, on average. We have many companies with net cash. We have, you know, pipeline politics kind of naturally strangling their ability to grow, plus investors themselves saying, you know, there's there's no reward in rising share prices to production growth. Instead, you know, the the, the surest path to higher stock prices is more buybacks, more dividends, more variables. We have so that means natural declines are falling. Uh, we've got inventory life, like our average holding, we think is about 17 years of stay flat inventory. So we don't need them to do M&A. If they do it, it better be bloody accretive on a free cash flow per share, as most transactions have been recently. So yeah, at, at $70 oil, we think the average company in Canada could pay about a 12% dividend next year. And that's what we model or buy back 12% of their stock. And with every $10 move in oil price from 70, that goes up by about 3%. So at 100, it's about 20%. The debate is dividends or buybacks. Do you have a strong opinion either way or is it depend? No, I think it's buybacks. So my playbook is return 75 to 100% of free cash flow back to us. Until your stock better reflects true fundamental value, which pick your oil price. At 70, I think that's about 70% higher than today. And at 100, I think it's about 160% higher than today. Use your free cash flow and buy back every single share that you can until you get closer to fair value, which is a long ways from now. And then at that point, pivot from buybacks to dividends. I'm not fond of dividends. I know if amongst retail, the guys obviously love to get paid on a monthly basis. I do too. But what I'm after is the capital appreciation, the challenge with variable dividends. So there's base, you know, most base dividends are very modest because companies never, ever, ever want to cut that base. So it's a couple percent, what do you do? The variable dividend then versus the buyback, there's a line and that is you can't value what you can't measure. Very few people have the ability to do the work to say, okay, at 70, at 80, at 90, this is what that variable dividend is going to be. And I don't think you'll get rewarded in a higher multiple from that. People will get the variable dividend. They'll say, thank you very much, but you won't get the benefit of a rising share price versus a buyback. If you buy back 20% of your shares, well, that's a 25% dividend increase the following year because you've got fewer shares to service. So you can achieve both by doing one. And I just I have supreme conviction because it's a mathematical certainty that if companies are super aggressive in buybacks, it must, has to drive the re-rating so long as the oil price cooperates. Trust in management. You have to trust the management will actually do this. How important is it? Oh, it's epically important. I will not buy a company if I do not trust the management, irrespective of how undervalued I, I think it is. Anytime I violated that rule, I get I get run over every single time. And so, yeah, it's good to be able to do business with friends because of trust. It's not always a, you know an mm-hmm. option, <laughs> but when it comes to management teams, you have to trust because just untrustworthy people will do stupid things, and your thesis goes out the window. Are there any clues that point towards that? Perhaps what they read, what, how they conduct their affairs? How do you know that? How do you detect that in management? I've been, yeah, I've been doing this for 20 odd years. Um, so I've made enough mistakes to see patterns. You just get a feel for somebody. You know, you can, feel, you can, within two minutes, you should have a feel whether they're trustworthy or not. Are they promotional or not? Do they make things up or not? How do they think? How do they process? Is it just, I don't have a, you know, two or three concrete things that I look for. It's just, you get a feel for somebody. And if, you know, there's enough opportunities out there that you don't have to, you you don't have to buy. There's several examples over 20 years. I won't get specific because it's personal, but you know, when you feel like you have to take a shower after meeting somebody, that's a pretty good sign. And I think people have an internal BS detector that you can sense that. Advice to the general investor as of March, 
30th, 2023. <laughs> well, let's, um, let's make it for energy spe- specifically. Yep. There are times when f- price doesn't reflect fundamentals and you've got to do your best to, to judge when that is. You cannot let fear and panic cloudy your judgment um, and you can't react to fear. As an investor, you should want those times. It sucks and it's painful to go through. You know, nobody likes to lose money, but so long as you have the ability to do so, you can take advantage of that because people do dumb things in that the peak of uncertainty. When we saw that three weeks ago, right? You've got a mass liquidation and crude contracts due to concerns about a banking contagion. You have energy stocks, underperformed bank stocks in a banking crisis, right? It makes no, absolutely no sense. And so if you, if you can just have that superior psychology that we talked about before, enough conviction, you can take advantage of that. So it's just not buying into the nonsense of allowing price to set narrative because many people that set that narrative, in my not so humble opinion, I guess, have no clue what they're talking about. And so it's just trying to see opportunities um, in periods of time when despite many frustrations and you know, battling politicians and SBR releases and recessionary fears and all of these things, there's opportunity in those, in those times. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your time. You bet. Happy to spend it with you. I uh, will wrap it up there. Thanks for listening, everyone. Hopefully you enjoyed the episode. If you liked what you heard, check out rosebros.ca where we will have upcoming shows. Until next time, happy coffee drinking. Thank you.